Most people studying deep learning are aware that the hyperparameters of their architecture and training strategy has a huge impact on the resulting performance. Hyperparameter tuning, also known as AutoML and sometimes meta-learning, is one of the most active areas of research, producing things like NosNet, AmoebaNet, AutoAugment, and population-based augmentation, to give a few examples. Despite the excitement of these AutoML algorithms, there's a huge gap in actual implementation and use. This results in most researchers just not using them altogether, relying on simpler random or grid searches for their experiments. This misses out on the massive performance boost achievable with AutoML. This video presents the key challenges to using cutting-edge AutoML and what determined AI has implemented that dramatically facilitates using these and leads to huge time and cost savings. To quickly preview the video, I think viewers will be very excited to learn about the implementation of fault-tolerant distributed training on these cheaper preemptible cloud instances. This is a huge uh, implementation boost that saves you a lot of money by using these preemptible cloud instances and then not having to worry about what happens if your access to the cloud computing is you know, randomly cut off. I also think viewers will be really excited to get a better understanding of the asynchronous successive having algorithm known as ASHA that's directly optimized for these actual practical engineering bottlenecks. This video will present the key obstacles to advanced hyperparameter tuning and the solutions that have been implemented in determined AI to supercharge your deep learning skills. This video will present the key technical challenges in implementing these advanced AutoML or hyperparameter tuning algorithms detailed in the blog post, Why Does No One Use Advanced Hyperparameter Tuning from Liam Lee at Determined AI. Throughout the different deep learning models and training algorithms, there are hyperparameters everywhere that dictate the final performance. The most common of these hyperparameters are the architecture configuration parameters of these different deep neural network architectures. These include ideas like the model depth, how many layers to stack on top of each other, the hidden size of the intermediate features, or say you have a feature extractor backbone and then you connect it to a feed forward uh, projection head for the classification, like say contrastive learning or all these architectures tend to then flatten out the features, connect it to a classification layer, the size of that layer, and then say the multiple attention heads, how many attention heads to use, and overall how many parameters are in the model. So there are hyperparameters everywhere that determine the success of these algorithms. So the high level overview, the macro structure of these layers, hidden size, number of attention heads, or even the micro details of how you implement these blocks, like the vision transformer and exactly how it does the design and the routing of the features, like say the transformer in transformer block, all these new designs that are coming out to try to have this fine grain search of the uh, transformer block itself that's repeated on top of itself as well as these other hyperparameters. So it's really a mess. There's so many hyperparameters that make up the final performance of these models. And so it's so important to have some way of searching through them to get a sense of what's important for the resulting performance. So to give a couple more examples before getting into the technical details of these AutoML hyperparameter search algorithms, we see in the Barlow Twins paper the effect of the different data augmentations used as you search through, say, not using the grayscale augmentation, not using color jittering, or not using cropping, and so on, and seeing the resulting performance, as well as looking at the final output projection, say going from 32 up to uh, 16,384, and all these fine-grained hyperparameter searches at the end of the representation in these contrastive learning algorithms. And these hyperparameters can even extend to the overall training algorithm itself. So in this paper, the T5 text-to-text -text transfer transformer, they take apart all these different uh, little components of the pre-training strategy. So they take apart the uh, left-to-right bidirectional attention encoding. That could be thought of as a hyperparameter in the overall training algorithm, as well as the corruption strategy. How are you going to mask out these tokens? Are you going to replace uh, contiguous spans or say, you know, you mask out three tokens in a row, what is the probability on masking out these tokens going to be, and then what exactly is going to be the length of these corrupted spans. So this is just an example of how many hyperparameters are associated with these uh, deep learning algorithms in the training algorithms, as well as the architecture itself. And then another pretty interesting example is this paper, Meta Learning Curiosity Algorithms, where not only are you putting together these blocks to make up neural architecture search, as you see this kind of diagram, looks similar to combining, say, a separable 3x3 convolution with max pooling and routing these features in that way. This is about routing the, the algorithm that has this intrinsic algorithm exploration search reward. So there are so many creative ways of how we can apply these AutoML, design these search spaces, and then use these 
uh, kind of black box optimization algorithms to design these optimal configurations of different parts of the deep learning training process. So because of the impact of this hyperparameter tuning, the deep learning research community is very excited and has been developing these auto ML search algorithms. We have things like using reinforcement learning controllers, evolutionary search, and things like a kind of curriculum strategy like population-based augmentation algorithm. We have differentiable architecture search and differentiable data augmentation. Then there's the Bayesian optimization, hierarchical neural architecture search, which is about how you're structuring this design space itself, the discretization of uh, how you're you know, parameterizing the search space itself, designing network design spaces, another look at moving the entire design space itself, and then hyperband, which we're gonna focus on a lot in this video because of its implementation and determined, where the idea is that you're having a non-uniform resource allocation to different configurations of these hyperparameters throughout the search. So here are a couple of surveys that uh, go through comprehensive lists of all these different AutoML search algorithms. And the high level idea in this presentation is that although there are these really exciting and powerful AutoML search algorithms, they are not easy to use. So despite the research and the development of these AutoML and hyperparameter tuning algorithms, they're still difficult to implement because of these three main challenges. The first of which is scaling to large problems where we want to use distributed computing, hyperparameter search algorithms that exploit this parallel computing, and then also noting that each of these models could take hours to train. Then the integration with backend systems as we want to save our uh, training states and have this uh, checkpointing on some kind of backend uh, database system and then providing sensible user interfaces, not just for say these uh, web UIs where you can see the say like a TensorBoard style visualization of the training curves, but also an interface that integrates with your Keras TensorFlow PyTorch code and makes it easier to integrate these determined functionalities into that kind of uh, PyTorch Keras TensorFlow uh, data loading, training step, and so on, that kind of interface. So here's the presentation outline in this video, why does no one use advanced hyperparameter tuning? And I recommend uh, kind of coming back to this slide and really kind of digesting this idea, these uh, different ideas over time and the fine grained details of what is making it so difficult to actually use these advanced hyperparameter tuning algorithms. So the first of which we mentioned is scaling to large problems where uh, you wanna exploit the massive parallelism of distributed computing, training takes a very long time, and you wanna use efficient early stopping. So the subparts of that, we're gonna look at tuning algorithms that exploit massive parallelism, describing this hyperband and then asynchronous uh, success of having the ASHA extension to hyperband that makes it even better at this uh, parallel computing when you might have failures and so on, you don't wanna have a synchronization step. And we'll talk about more of the, talk more about that later. But this idea of say you have a reinforced learning controller and evolutionary fitness function, you have to synchronize all of the different training workloads onto a single centralized server and that could be a huge bottleneck in the training. So that's the idea behind this asynchronous idea with the hyperparameter search. The next thing is automated checkpointing for efficient early stopping. How are we gonna have this automated checkpointing where we can rest, where we can pause and resume training? So early stopping, we're doing this ununiform uh, resource allocation where we have this uh, criterion for continuing training on the configurations of hyperparameters that look like they're gonna be successful. And we need to be able to pause and rerun it without losing too much computation. And then distributed training for large scale models where we're, we don't wanna to have to really implement all the data sharding communication between the parameters ourselves, so we use determined AI to take care of this for us. The next key idea is integration with backend systems. So this can describe this whole idea of cluster management. You have a team, you're working with a cluster, you wanna do things like resource provisioning and experiment scheduling within your team. You don't want uh, you know one team member to block up the whole uh, compute cluster for everyone on the team. And then artifact tracking for reproducibility where we have say, the container, the TensorFlow version of the code, or also the random seeds, the state of the optimizer, all these kind of ideas of tracking these different things that make up the training. And then finally, providing sensible user interfaces. So not just these web UIs that you know make it really easy to kind of click buttons and look through it, but the interfaces that integrate with your code. So how do you actually uh, loop your Keras, PyTorch, TensorFlow code within the determined framework and uses functionality within your existing coding workflows. We'll begin with the issue of scaling to large problems. We're training these massive deep neural networks that take maybe hundreds or thousands of hours to train. These are you know large networks, they train through many batches of data, and it takes a long time to train each individual configuration of the hyperparameters, let alone search through hundreds or thousands of them. So the two criterion that they highlight in this blog post are efficiency and parallelism. So efficiency is about how much computation is required to find a high quality hyperparameter configuration and the solution of this is early stopping so early stopping is the idea of we train each model for 
you know, say it takes 200 epochs for it to converge, but we're still gonna stop it at 20 because after 20, it doesn't look like it's gonna uh, perform very well. The next key criterion is how well do these hyperparameter search algorithms exploit parallelism and distributed computing? So for example, when we have this synchronization, say we have a reinforcement learning controller or an evolutionary search or Bayesian optimization, it's gonna need to aggregate all the results of the current population of testing these different hyperparameter configurations. So a Bayesian optimization, it's gonna aggregate all the different results and then it's going to form that uh, that boundary on what its belief state is on the landscape of the uh, hyperparameter configurations in that black box optimization kind of style. Same with the evolutionary search, it's going to need to have this fitness function where it aggregates all the different uh, performances of the hyperparameters and then computes here's the top 10% and so on and then mutation and that kind of algorithm. But So we want to have algorithms that don't need synchronization. We don't want it to have to come together on a centralized uh, computer when it's evaluating these different uh, algorithms and the solution to this is this asynchronous successive having extension on the hyperband uh, non-uniform resource allocation where you don't need to uh, regroup and see which configurations are performing well rather you have this way of doing this asynchronously so if there's a failure or one computer is just faster than another as in these distributed computing systems the algorithm won't be uh, heavily bottlenecked by that so let's start with the practical benefit of tuning algorithms that exploit massive parallelism because the hyperparameter tuning algorithm itself whether it's this reinforced learning controller differentiable augmentation or whatever it is is just one part of really applying and implementing these uh, tuning systems within the real uh, computation systems that we have and notably these distributed computing systems are the dominant way of doing this where you parallelize this across say 64 GPUs and so on that's the dominant way of really training these models. The key algorithm in doing this is the asynchronous successive having algorithm. So comparing this, let's start from the beginning with what you might use, what's easy to use with respect to this hyperparameter optimization. So with grid search and random search, you could easily parallelize this because you just have a space of configurations and you just send a different configuration to say each of the 64 GPUs. That would be, you know, if you can train a model on a single GPU or, you know, if you distribute it, say it needs two per training, 32 and so on, that kind of idea. So the grid search, random search, they're really just randomly picking these different things to search through. Whereas this hyperband algorithm is gonna particularly introduce this idea Idea of early stopping and not continuing training with the configurations that aren't performing well. So say you have this uh, seven, just a random space in your configurations that is performing poorly, no need to keep you know, allocating resources to training that, and that's the key idea. But here's the key extension in ASHA compared to hyperband. So in hyperband, you need to have the synchronization step to evaluate which one of the configurations aren't performing well. So to say that seven is in this red zone, you need to see the performance of all the other different configurations to note that. And that has a synchronization step that is bottlenecking this distributed training. So the idea behind asynchronous having is that you're going to have this global parameter space that it's going to look up with respect to when each of the individual workers finishes his training job, but it's not going to keep synchronizing them all together and wait for everything to be done. Rather, it's just going to say, have you met this criterion? No. And then it's going to grow it. If it doesn't uh, meet the criterion for continued training, it's going to just cut that configuration all together and grow it from the bottom up. So it'll allocate a new uh, configuration that hasn't trained at all instead of resuming training with this one that say has had 40 epochs of training is not performing well but there isn't like a global synchronization step rather you have this running moving thing where one worker finishes updates it then goes back to what it's doing rather than having to wait for say all the other 63 GPUs or you know whatever the configuration is to finish to get the information to keep going so it's growing it from the bottom up and that's what's being shown in this diagram is how they don't meet the criterion so they grow it from the bottom up allocate resources to a configuration that hasn't been explored before and notably most of these configuration spaces are gigantic so it's not like uh, you know this growing up from the bottom is is another huge problem where you're just kind of growing it you know left to right on this diagram and evaluating uh, too many configurations without focus on individual ones. So here's the key takeaway if you're watching this video wondering what determined AI can do for your training workloads and your hyperparameter search. Our adaptive algorithm exploits early stopping to evaluate up to 100 times more hyperparameter settings than brute force approaches like random and grid search. So evaluating up to 100 times more hyperparameter settings can be a huge benefit when you're searching through, as we mentioned previously, the number of layers, depth, microcells, the, even the meta-learning, the curiosity algorithms thing. Being able to evaluate 100 times more hyperparameter settings is a huge advancement in your deep learning training workflows. The next core point is automated checkpointing for efficient early stopping. So we've seen the benefit of doing this early stopping where we don't continue training on a configuration that isn't performing well, but now we actually have to implement this checkpointing. So Determine is implementing this under the hood for us, and that's the key idea that we don't need to bother with 
you know, changing our code to do this. So we're trying to pause and resume training with thousands of trials. That's the idea where we pause it and then we go and get the centralized parameter server, see what's happening, see if we should continue or not. And if so, we need to resume the training or we need to have the optimizer state, the same batch of data that's been loaded and the parameters of the model as well. So Determine is automatically saving these models and the other stateful objects like the data batching and the um, optimizer parameters. So we don't have to write this code to save and resume models. And that's one of the features that Determine is offering to make it easier to implement these hyperparameter tuning algorithms for your real workflows. So then we come back to this idea of distributed training for large scale models. So we've seen how in uh, Keras is really just uh, one line of code to do the say tf.distribute.mirrored strategy, this kind of PyTorch test syntax for this too, for really implementing these uh, distributed training and not really you know having to have a great sense of what's exactly happening under the hood. And Determine is also implementing this for you. So all you need to do to hand off Determine's distributed training is just implement this one line in the configuration file where you have, and I made a previous video that walks through uh, their CIFAR 10 example. There's gonna be more examples on Henry AI Labs of walking through these examples, but basically they have a configuration file that organizes what you're uh, sending off to Determine's API. Going back again to this interfaces idea, which we'll explore, which is point uh, 3A in this presentation, but all you need to do to hand this off to Determine is just resources, slots per tile, 64, and that will use 64 GPUs to train a single hyperparameter setting, and you can again get more fine grained with how you want to implement this, and there are more advanced options as well. So here's the key idea, and next we're going to get into on-demand versus spot instances, which is one of the most exciting ideas in this presentation altogether, but you see the training time reduction from one GPU to 64 GPUs. Determine is automatically handling this data sharding and communication of model parameters for you. All you have to do is modify this one line in the configuration file. So let's come back to this idea of combining this asynchronous early stopping search algorithm with distributed training and the time it would take to say train all these configurations with distributed training to convergence. So given that Determine's adaptive hyperparameter tuning algorithm can find a high quality hyperparameter configuration in about the same time it would take to train a single model to convergence. So it's training a single model with distributed training, one of these massive deep neural networks that take a long time to train. The distributed training makes the hyperparameter tuning tractable for even the largest model. So you can still do so even if you have these gigantic models that take forever to train individually, because of this early stopping thing, you can still now use hyperparameter tuning with these large models, and it's now easy to do with this early stopping, asynchronous, success of having thing. And then again, all of the actual code you need to do this is implemented in Determine. So you don't actually have to figure out how you would implement this for yourself. The next major point is integrating with backend systems. We have these distributed workers that each go and take a configuration of the parameters and optimize them. And even though the asynchronous algorithm is trying to get away from the centralized updates as much as possible, you still have to have this communication with the backend system to pause and resume training and have some kind of uh, global parameter update. And that's, I don't think you can have a, uh, hyperparameter search algorithm that has no kind of centralized information to send to each of the workers. So what is the key change for advanced hyperparameter search compared to random or grid search? And that's that these intermediate results need to be communicated to the algorithm so the algorithm state can be updated to generate future workloads. This is true for evolutionary search, reinforced learning search, Bayesian optimization, whatever the advanced hyperparameter search algorithm is, there needs to be some centralization with the updates from each of the workers in order to have this uh, you know, meta controller that has the information about exploring these different configurations. So this is bringing us to one of the most exciting parts of this presentation and one of the most exciting features of Determined AI, which is using these spot or preemptible instances. So the high level overview of this is that with these cloud providers like Google Cloud and AWS, they have on-demand instances where you're you know, a priority customer and they, they're going to you know, not cut off your access to the GPU. But when you use these spot instances, you're basically gambling with how they're going to just cut away your access to the GPU. So that makes this uh, problem of fault tolerant training very important. If you're just going to lose the access to the computer at any time, you need to have some way of saving the parameters, the optimizer state, the data bashing, and so on in case it gets cut off. So Determine is implementing this under the hood idea of how to do fault tolerant distributed training to really utilize these spot instances. So going down in this article, you can see how much money you can save by using these uh, instances where they'll just cut it off at any moment compared to the on-demand pricing. And you see basically a 3x saving in each case. And then also this key idea of you know, thinking about how you're man managing your infrastructure as a team, you might you might still have an on-premise system, but you might want to scale it up when you know a certain workload comes through that you need to do so, and so on. So this is making this overall cloud computing idea more economical, which is great. I mean, save time and save money. That's the key idea of any product that is doing that for you is great. 
So this is a key feature of determined AI is making deep learning training fault tolerant. So if it randomly cuts off access to it, the state of the training is preserved. It's not gonna just have, you've lost all that compute you did and you might've paid for that as well. So obviously that would not be good. And now we have fault tolerant training implemented in determined AI. So this Twitter thread describes the idea, uh, the job is restarted automatically with minimal loss of work. And you know, these training these deep neural networks, they can tr take a long time to train and they're giant they loop through this massive data set and so on and then back prop and so on so it takes a long time to train these models but fault tolerance isn't already given so tensorflow and pytorch they do support fault tolerance you know how you can you know save and load your model weights that kind of idea but there is more to checkpointing and restarting your training than just saving and loading the weights you also want to maybe save and restore the job's position in the training set as you're looping through this training data with each of these uh, batches through the training data and you also want to save and restore these random seeds and then imagine you also have say dropout or these probabilistic layers say like how the um like the style gan architecture it has these random noise maps the b pathways if you study the style gan architecture where it introduces these random variables into the training as well so you want to make that reproducible and be able to pause and resume training in case it crashes so and then also you know handling these custom layers would be where you're actually implementing a probabilistic layer like the style gan kind of the b noise pathway and then the PyTorch guide on saving and restoring models is almost 1800 words. So you wanna have this implemented and now we're adding on the complexity as well of doing a hyperparameter search. So not only do we have just one set of checkpoints, so we have one set of checkpoints that says, you know, model one weights, model one, uh, you know, training data and so on. We have a set of checkpoints for each of these different models and we could be exploring thousands of different configurations of these hyperparameters. So, it's a massive problem of trying to implement this fault tolerance, and it's a huge benefit that Determine has already implemented this under the hood, and you don't have to worry about the complexity of managing all these different intermediate training states throughout thousands of different hyperparameter configurations. So let's take a step back and think about the context in which we're implementing and running these large-scale hyperparameter searches. So say you have a team of you know 10 developers, and you're all sharing this one computing cluster, and then someone wants to allocate this massive hyperparameter search job. So first, you start this off with the syntax of determine deploy, the AWS GCP option, and then the cluster ID and the project ID. And now you have this interesting idea of the experiment scheduling. So the common practice in things like uh, Slurm and these uh, scheduling algorithms for uh, computing clusters is to do first in, first out scheduling. So this queue scheduling of the first person to submit a job, the thing runs until they are finished. So this can be a big problem with these uh, hyperparameter search algorithms and you want to have this fair share of scheduling instead and there's the reasoning they also provide is this uh, intermediate stages of the search algorithm where say it begins with this bottom-up growing of just seeing all these configurations and then it uses the full set of resources but then it's converged on say four different configurations that are worth continued training and in that case you then want to uh, re-chunk the utilization so that other jobs can run and they're not blocked so say you have 64 GPUs and it only takes uh, like four or two GPUs to train each model, and then on the upper bound of that, you train, you put 16 aside to train those four configurations, then you let, you know, you have all the other GPUs available for the rest of the team. One of the core challenges in machine learning experimentation is reproducibility. So Determine is implementing these key artifact trackings to enable reproducibility that include saving the uh, containers, the versions of TensorFlow or PyTorch, NumPy, all these different things that could have some kind of change as you evolve, the, as you know, as the software evolves over time, not that you're personally changing TensorFlow and so on, but as you know, TensorFlow goes from 2.1, 2.2, and so on. And then which version of the code that I use is the actual code that you're building yourself, maybe with your team and you know, tracking and having this version control of updating the code. And then which checkpoints gave me that result again, again, random seeds and data batching probabilistic layers that all make for more reproducible experiments. So the key ideas is resume the hyperparameter tuning experiments where they left off. You can fork the experiment and run it with a different configuration and having this easy syntax to uh, you know, set aside, maybe you're running a hyperparameter configuration and you're visually inspecting this and then you're saying, I actually wanna change the design space. So the design space is the discrete parameterization of the, you know, the hyperparameters you're searching through. So you say you're watching this and then you wanna fork it and then change that design space and then run another experiment. So this interface is making it easy to do that and then they're saving the artifact tracking to be able to reproduce each of these different things. And then you can warm start this training from a checkpoint by specifying the checkpoint ID. So again, 
say we have this hyperparameter search where we have a hundred different models with all their different checkpoints, you can easily index the checkpointing for an individual configuration that you want to say, you know, take that aside and then try some different strategies for say a curriculum learning or different ways to, con to continue that training from that checkpoint. The next key dimension of applying advanced hyperparameter tuning is providing sensible user interfaces with the determined uh, functionality. So there are really two levels of this. There's the friendly interface, which is uh, integrated with your code itself, where you're writing the Keras PyTorch code and integrating that into to the determined uh, the API for running that function call and accessing that configuration YAML file. And then there's the graphical web UI that provides this nice interface for visually inspecting what's happening with your model training. So we'll begin with the interface that's designed to stack on top of your code itself. So these, th these uh, points one and two are referencing the hyperparameter tuning algorithms themselves. And you could even have hyperparameter tuning on top of the hyperparameter tuning. So evolutionary search, Bayesian optimization, reinforcement, and coming back to that, those meta algorithms for searching for hyperparameters for the nested problem, those could have hyperparameters themselves. So this is recursion of the hyperparameters that I guess would never end. But so they have these internal hyperparameters of the ASHA algorithm that would need to be configured. You would actually need to even tune those algorithms to find the absolute best performance. But what's built under the hood and determined is they already have the, you know, they've tested this on many different training workflows and they have a standard set of hyperparameters for the hyperparameter tuning algorithm for your sake of using, using it. So you don't really need to worry about this kind of idea of the meta hyperparameters of the hyperparameter search algorithm. You can just use this off the shelf implementation and just add this to the configuration YAML file. So next up is the graphical web UI. This is for when you wanna inspect these different configurations. You click on the view configuration to see the YAML file of each of these individual configurations. And then you can view the, you know, the training curves, the time, how much they've each been training for as you have this dynamic resource allocation. And this picture is even outdated in a future video on Henry AI Labs, we'll walk through the latest update to this interface. They've added even more uh, features to this and visualizations to make this even nicer. But this is really useful for, you know, once you've written the code, interfaced it with the code, and now you wanna actually look at the training. You don't wanna just, uh, you know, let this idly go by because you probably have some intuition about what's happening as it's traversing the search space. That again, you might want to click this button to fork it and then reconfigure the design space itself. So that's a really interesting kind of dimension of these AutoML search algorithms is that you could intervene on this and redesign the search space itself. Maybe you want to do that, maybe you don't. But ideas like say designing network design spaces, which is you know stepping one level up this meta hierarchy and design it and reconfiguring, reparameterizing the search space throughout the search. So it's an interesting idea and definitely one that could improve your training. So having presented these three core ideas and each of the sub problems within them, let's look at determinant in action in the most common hyperparameter search, which is neural architecture search and searching for RNN and CNN architectures. So this is the idea in neural architecture search, there's say micro and macro level search. So macro level search goes back to the very beginning of this presentation where you have the vision transformer and you're making decisions like how many layers to use, the width of the features or the input resolution, those kinds of like scaling strategies. Those are the macro configurations of these cells. But this is the micro configuration where you're really designing these blocks that are stacked on top of each other. So if you've seen the uh, transformer block, it has this self attention layer, then it has feed forward, skip connections, layer normalization. So there's complexity within the blocks that are then stacked on top of themselves as well. You could imagine, you know, redesigning the transformer layer, redesigning the normalization layer, having different pathways for how the information flows in these micro blocks. And that's what neural architecture search is trying to optimize as a parameterization, a massive search space of different ways to connect these say this is the feature set from the previous layer this is the skip connection from layer l minus two and you're figuring out how you want to you know propose and present this new micro block of composing these intermediate features connecting them with different processing operations like convolution skip connections max pooling or you know the attention layer would be added to this nowadays and then different ways of configuration of lstm cells so the lstm it has this input gate, forgets gate, uh, you know, cell output gate, and so on, different ways of routing that information, different activations you can apply like TAN, ReLU, all sorts of different meta parameters that go on within the micro block. So this DARTS paper proposes the search space, which is gonna be the standard benchmark for testing out these different search algorithms and comparing ASHA with Bayesian optimization, random search and grid search, on this discrete parameterization of these microcells. So first we're searching for RNN architectures in a search space of over 15 billion possible architectures. So we're talking about these different configurations of the hyperparameters, the magnitude of that is 15 billion different architectures and the CNN space is even larger. 
So the determined is able to find a model. This is language modeling and perplexities of metrics and lower is better. So it's able to get lower than this metric after considering 300 configurations out of the 15 billion after six hours. And then here's the key, here's the key takeaway of what's so interesting about this. So determined has explored about a thousand configurations compared to the 20 configurations that would be evaluated by a random search. So without this early stopping and then this asynchronous early stopping, you would only evaluate 20 compared to 1,000. So it's $50 to evaluate 1,000 with, again, the spot instances and how determined it's implementing this fault tolerant distributed training to utilize these preemptible instances compared, which is an absolutely huge advance. And look at the cost savings, $7,000 compared to $50. It's, completely game changing. So $7,000 for random search to have evaluated the 1000 configurations without any early stopping and then using the on demand instead of the spot instances. So here's the result of comparing the ASHA algorithm with Bayesian optimization. I think this is even Bayesian optimization with hyperband as well. So the idea behind uh, Bayesian optimization is that you also have a model that is modeling the black box search space. So it has this um, prior belief on where it thinks these configurations are going to perform better based on what it's explored and just kind of modeling the space with no prior knowledge of um, the search space beforehand, but it learns it throughout testing the different configurations. And then hyperband is again the idea of using early stopping, but not doing it asynchronously. So the key thing on why Asha is able to outperform this, uh, you know, sophisticated algorithm of using Bayesian optimization to select which configuration to choose next. So you have the uh, 15 billion architectures, and then you're trying to pick which one is, you know, like active learning, trying to pick which one would be the best thing to sample from next. The reason that doesn't perform as well as Asha is because this needs to have this synchronization step that makes it slower. So it needs to you know, come together, take all the results from all the different workers and say, okay, here are the results. Let's update our belief about this search space and then pick another set to sample from. Whereas Asha is just one worker finishes and then gets its asynchronous update and then just goes right back to work. So it's quicker to evaluate more configurations. So next up is the more common searching for CNN architectures. And as of the time of making this video, we're seeing this search for the vision transformer architecture that's following the similar kind of similar kind of trajectory where it's just a crazy frenzy of trying to find the optimal configuration of this vision transformer architecture. So in the CNN architecture space from the darts paper, you have over 10 to the 18 possible architectures. So 10 to the 18 different configurations of the hyperparameters of these microcells, again, in what we're searching through here with the neural architecture search. So after 20 hours, again, Determine has explored a thousand configurations. It took 20 hours. So not only the time saving that it would take random search to train all a thousand models to convergence, $23,000 compared to $150 with the idea of early stopping, asynchronous early stopping, and then preemptible instances compared to on-demand instances. So huge cost savings, obviously $23,000 compared to $150. And then here's the same uh, curve. Again, this time the metric is accuracy, higher is better. And the performance of ASHA compared to Bayesian optimization, which I think is Bayesian optimization with hyperband as well. But the key idea is that it doesn't have this asynchronous uh, sending off of the workers to train their model, rather they have to all come together and then update their belief state about which configuration to which set of configurations to explore next. So this presentation presented several of the key ideas for why implementing these advanced hyperparameter tuning algorithms can be pretty difficult in practice and what Determined is doing for you, particularly in my opinion, the key takeaways are these implementations of fault tolerant distributed training with the spot preemptible instances, the huge cost savings you get from that, as well as the advancement of this asynchronous uh, having algorithm, which really works well with the parallelization of this distributed computing training. So please leave a comment with what you want to learn about determined AI as I'm figuring out, you know, which videos, which particular ideas in hyperparameter tuning are the most interesting for people to focus on. Is it the, you know, the integration with your interfaces? How do I actually get my, say, Keras code into the determined platform? Uh, what about these other kind of hyperparameter search algorithms? Uh, can I search through data augmentation? Maybe like you have a particular idea about which hyperparameter you're trying to search through. Any uh, considerations you have about determined AI, if you leave a comment, I'll try to give you my best answer and maybe de uh, develop some videos around these different uh, concepts. So thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos and more content about determined AI.